I'm Paul Coleman. Um, very honored to be able to introduce this panel of five graduate students who are addressing issues in their doctoral dissertation research that are congruent with the themes of this conference. And so I'm not going to really introduce them because I don't want to take away from the brief compass they have to present their current work to us. Four of them, the first four who will speak, are current PhD students in the World Religions World Church program at the University of Notre Dame. The fifth student is a doctoral student in the School of Theology and Religion. Uh, ecclesiology. Ecle an, an ecclesiologist, uh, ecclesiology student in systematic theology at Boston College. So, without further ado, I give you our grad students. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Kuyper, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm just going to dive right in because we have very limited time. I'd like to begin today by going back to 1897. In that year, Thomas Arnold published The Preaching of Islam, a history of the propagation of the Muslim faith. It was the earliest Western attempt at a comprehensive and sympathetic study of da'wah, or as Arnold put it, Muslim missionary activity. Arnold wrote this book from Aligarh, India, where he was associated with leading Muslim thinkers like Sir Syed Ahmed Khan and Muhammad Shibli Numani. Though Arnold's book is now quite dated, in my view, he was right to focus on da'wah as a central feature of Islamic history, and he rightly anticipated that da'wah would be significant to the story of Muslim communities moving forward into the future. Arnold ended the 1913 second edition of his book with tentative thoughts on what he called a new development in the Muslim world, that is the founding and formation of Muslim missionary societies, much on the Protestant voluntary model. I start with the preaching of Islam for several reasons. First, we are now in a much better position, 100 years later, to analyze what Arnold could only see dimly and distantly. Dawah efforts and discourses have multiplied exponentially since Arnold's time. Second, I don't think it is incidental that Arnold wrote his book from North India. Briefly, Dawah comes from an Arabic root that has to do with calling, inviting, or summoning. In the Quran, God and the Prophet Muhammad are the main callers, or da'is. As Professor Reynolds pointed out yesterday, I argue in an early chapter of my dissertation that the Quran itself is the foundational da'wah of Islam, and that the Quran significantly addresses its da'wah to an interreligious milieu. Along with God and the Prophet, there are also several verses in the Quran that seem to imply that all the believers are to be involved in calling or da'wah. I've put a several, uh, several verses up here on the slide. Uh, just a couple verses out of many that I could have chosen from the Qur'an that have become very significant in modern da'wah discourse among Muslims. In fact, I suspect that Surat An-Nahl, that is 16125, may be one of the most quoted verses in the Muslim world today. I don't have necessarily qualitative proof for that, but based on my research, I think it may be one of the most quoted verses uh, in the world today. It begins, Ad'u illa sabil Allahi. So, Call, the, the first word in Arabic is from the same root as dawah. It means call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction. And this is a challenge that contemporary Muslims have taken up with great vigor uh, in our time. Beyond the Quran, in the second chapter of my project, I study how dawah has been used in different ways in pre-modern Islamic history. But in the past hundred years, dawah has experienced a remarkable boom, as I've already noted. Today, da'wah is carried out by large institutions and by small private organizations, in student associations, and of course on the internet where there are now thousands of da'wah websites. It is also promoted by Muslim governments like Saudi Arabia and intergovernmental organizations like the OIC or Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Da'wah encompasses street preaching, satellite television, social media, and even global jihad. Now, many recent studies analyze da'wah through the lenses of politics, economics, or colonialism and post-colonialism. While these are certainly important angles of analysis, I think a preoccupation with them can blind the investigator to what the actors themselves are saying. In fact, I argue that the discourses of leading da'wah organizations and activists show a preoccupation with intra- and interreligious opportunities and threats. And this leads me to India where Muslim communities have long dealt with the problem of Islamization in the context of religious diversity or religious pluralism. The historian Barbara Metcalf puts it this way. I would suggest, I'll turn this way, 
that if one seeks access to the Islamic movements of modern times, one ought to turn to the history of the Muslims of South Asia. And I think she's right. And here's why. To put it briefly, Indian Muslims have pioneered what I am calling bottom-up or grassroots, that is usually non-state or non-political approaches to dawah that have proven extremely effective around the world. This leads me to a hypothesis, namely that the global popularity of bottom-up Indian styles of dawah is related to the fact that the situation of many Muslims worldwide has come to resemble the situation of the Muslims of India. What I mean by this is that the political reversal India's Muslims suffered in the 18th and 19th century was, was particularly traumatic. Along with this has been their long experience of living in a land dominated demographically by non-Muslims, Hindus in particular. Indian Muslims were also among the first to use English as a medium for Islamic discourse. In addition, they were among the first to be galvanized by competitive missionization. Not only were Christian missionaries increasingly active in India during the long 19th century, Hindu missionaries from groups like the Arya Samaj, and even from the new Islamic sect, the Ahmadiyya, also did aggressive missionary work in India beginning in the late 19th century. So now to get at all of these themes, in which I've introduced only very briefly, in concrete terms, my dissertation, after exploring the roots of dawah in the Quran and Hadith literature, and then several examples of dawah in pre-modern Islamic history, examines the histories and interreligious discourses of two of the most prominent Sunni dawah organizations to emerge from India in the past century, the Tablighi Jamaat, or TJ, as I'll call it, and the Islamic Research Foundation of the popular televangelist Zakir Naik, or IRF. Today, each of these organizations claims a worldwide following numbering in the tens of millions. Both are bottom-up, or concerned with mobilizing the Muslim masses to engage in dawah. Both, moreover, are concerned with intra- and interreligious relations, but they carry out their missions in very distinctive ways. The TJ has been called the most successful Islamic dawah organization in the world today. It is active in over 150 countries, including this country, and claims more than 20 million active participants. The TJ was founded by, Ma by Maulana Muhammad Ilyas, a Delhi-based Muslim scholar in the 1930s. In Ilyas's colonial and post-colonial context, he believed that jihad could best be carried out as dawah. This meant going to ordinary Muslims, reviving them, teaching them the basics of Islam, and mobilizing them as door-to-door -door preachers of Islam. Ilyas wanted every Muslim to be a da'i, or evangelist, or missionary. The TJ, in short, mobilizes millions of lay volunteers who go out on self-supporting short and long-term missions around the world. These characteristics make the TJ globally relevant and very popular. Participation in the TJ enables Muslim expressions of loyalty, where political options do not exist, and creates transnational solidarity in an uprooted age. As far as literature is concerned, the TJ's primary text is the Faza'il Amal. This may be the most important dawah dawa manual in the world today. And I am analyzing this text for the first time through the lens of intra and interreligious relations. The Faza'il Amal was written by uh, a close associate of Malana Ilyas, Malana Muhammad Zakaria. Now in contrast to the TJ, my second case study is that of the Mumbai-based, or Bombay-based, medical doctor turned global Islamic preacher, Dr. Zakir Naik. In March of this past year, Naik was featured on the front page of the New York Times after he was awarded the prestigious Saudi King Faisal Prize for service to Islam. Since that time, Naik has made the King Faisal Prize the centerpiece, as you can see, of his promotional activities. Nayak presents himself not only as a dynamic international orator, but also, importantly, as a scholar of what he calls comparative religion. Whatever one makes of Nayak, there is no question that he has become one of the most popular Islamic preachers and media moguls in the world today. Along with the IRF, which he founded in 1991, Nayak is the founder of Peace TV, a 24-hour Islamic satellite television channel which can now be seen in more than 125 countries. Here's the main thing for my purposes. Naik and the IRF are still bottom up. That is, they are concerned with reviving and mobilizing Muslims on a mass scale, 
But in this case, the effort is centered around a charismatic superstar preacher and the heavy use of modern media technology. It is also very important that Nayak positions himself as an expert in what he calls comparative religion. Nayak's model of bottom-up da'wah is clearly relevant to many Muslims in a global society. His ministry fosters a sense of pride and self-respect. Here is a preacher who holds his own and even trounces competitors from other religions in interreligious debate. Now what about beauty? I'll end with this. Though polemics and proselytism get a bad rap among scholars in our day, I believe scholars like us need to pay careful attention to movements of this kind. Despite aspects that we might find personally distasteful, there is still something, first of all, significant and important, but also, I would argue, beautiful about the vigorous commitment, agency, and activism called forth by Dawa movements like the TJ and IRF. TJ grassroots activists and the mega preacher Nike are both motivated, I believe, by a genuine sense of what they see as the compelling beauty of the Islamic way of life and they wish to spread that as widely as possible through bottom-up dawah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison fitchett Klemenega. I'm a fourth-year student in the World Religions and World Church program. So I'm just beginning at this point to do my research and writing for my dissertation. The project is still in its early stages of development, so today I'm just going to try to sketch out some of the broad contours of the project. In my dissertation, I will be researching Catholic charismatics in western Uganda, and I will compare and contrast two Catholic movements that are active in a parish that's under the care of the Congregation of Holy Cross. The first movement is called the Charismatic Renewal, and the second is called the Bekaizo, which means witnesses or martyrs in the local language. Both of them are referred to as movements of the spirit, and they share a number of features with each other, but they also differ in terms of their historical trajectory and their emphases. For now, I'm calling them both Catholic Charismatic movements because they both treat the possession of charismatic gifts as an important source of religious authority, and they stress the availability of those gifts, at least theoretically, to all believers. By comparing those two movements, I hope to get a sense of who chooses to participate in each one and why they do, and also to show the range of options that are available for how to be a charismatic Catholic. So first, let me briefly describe the two movements for you, and then I'll say a little bit about what I plan to focus on in the dissertation. The charismatic renewal in Western Uganda is linked very closely with the international Catholic charismatic renewal. It emphasizes the availability of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to all believers, and it encourages participants to expect the Spirit to transform their lives. The renewal encourages members to lead vibrant, engaged lives of faith, through participating in regular prayer group meetings, retreats, seminars, and healing and deliverance services. People tend to associate the movement with a strong emphasis on the word of God, vibrant, expressive worship, and participation in the sacramental life of the church. The Bakaizo, on the other hand, is a movement that originated in Uganda, and it is devoted especially to Ugandan Christians martyred in the 1880s. It celebrates the gifts of the Spirit through practices that are similar to those of the charismatic renewal, and it too stresses the power of the spiritual realm to affect everyday human life. As in the renewal, Bakaizo participants meet for prayer and worship, and they engage in rituals to discern the presence of malign spiritual power and to deliver those who are afflicted. The Bakaizo differs from the renewal, though, in several ways. For instance, compared with the charismatic renewal, it places a greater emphasis on the Uganda martyrs, and its members tend to prefer more traditional hymns and devotional practices. Church leaders have also tended to be less accepting of the Bekaizo than of the charismatic renewal. In my dissertation, I'm going to be focusing particularly on the healing and deliverance practices of these two movements, 
and how those practices can cause the movements to play a paradoxical role in the parish community. On the one hand, they heal wounded individuals and communities, but on the other hand, they often themselves generate conflict in the community. So first, a word about their healing potential. The movements promise and often deliver healing to individuals who are experiencing physical, social, and spiritual suffering. For instance, deliverance from possession by an unwanted spirit <clears throat> restores an individual's spiritual integrity, and in so doing, it also stands to repair things like physical health and relationships with family and neighbors, because these things can also be affected by possession. Moreover, the movements can promote social reconciliation or healing of relationships within the broader community. For example, the group's testimony and deliverance practices can help address things like witchcraft accusations. They offer a means of rehabilitating those who are accused of witchcraft and reintegrating them into the community. This can help to limit conflict and violence because without a mechanism like this, <laughs> those who are suspected of practicing witchcraft can easily find themselves subject to ostracism, seizure of property, and physical abuse. So at both the individual and the communal level, the charismatic renewal and the Bacaizo can play an integrating role. On the other hand, the two movements can themselves become a source of conflict in the community. First of all, the activities of the groups sometimes generate tensions in the community because healing can involve reorganizing social relationships. For example, in the parish where I will work, children are considered to be especially sensitive to the spiritual realm, which is thought to enable them to serve as channels for the Holy Spirit and to discern the presence of people and objects that are associated with malign spiritual forces. This has generated a great deal of controversy, for children have frequently implicated their elders, including their parents, in the practice of witchcraft. This has destabilized established social hierarchies and threaten those who occupy positions of authority. Also, the healing practices of the charismatic renewal and the Bacaizo are the subject of a great deal of controversy. The two groups sometimes disagree with each other over how best to address physical and spiritual affliction, and members sometimes clash with each other over those differences. Their healing practices are even more controversial among those who do not participate in the two movements. For the charismatic renewal and the Bacaizo articulate forms of theology and practice that sometimes depart from mainstream Catholicism. Observers worry about how the group's healing practices might impact the spiritual and social life of the community. They are concerned, for instance, that both groups encourage people to focus on miracles, discouraging the development of mature Christian discipleship and teaching people to expect quick fixes to trenchant social problems. <coughs> They also fear that the habit of interpreting broken relationships, illness, and death through the lens of spiritual affliction threatens more constructive ways of engaging those problems. Debates about those matters can become bitter, sowing dissent in the community about what kinds of behaviors and beliefs are acceptable for Catholic Christians. Hence, the group's healing practices can become a destabilizing force in the community. So in my dissertation research, I'm gonna be trying to tease out why it is that the charismatic renewal and the Bacaizo simultaneously heal and generate conflict. One thing that I'm interested in exploring is how that double role might be related to processes of Catholic identity formation in Uganda. So I'll be looking at how the two groups map out particular ways of being Catholic in Uganda and how the controversies surrounding them reflect debates about what it means to be appropriately Catholic. I want to see why people reject or choose to participate in the two movements and use that to think about how different lay people in the parish, as well as the Holy Cross priests and brothers and sisters who work there, how, the, how it is they understand what it means to be Catholic there. So, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for coming today, and thank you for exhibiting your staying power until today. <laughs> My name is Eno Dango. I'm also in the fourth year um, uh, PhD program, and uh, along with Alison, I'm f probably not further uh, 
further be beyond where Allison is right now because I just turned in my proposal two weeks ago. So what you will have today is going to be an abstract and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, to give you an overview of, of the topic that I'm interested in. Um, the title of my, uh, propo my proposed topic is Muhammad Assad Interpreting the Quran for the Modern Mind. The final scene of a 2008 video documentary on the life of Muhammad Assad, which I think is very sk skillfully conceptualized, certainly captures what Muhammad Assad represents. It is a dialogue that takes place in, uh, in a cemetery in Granada, Spain, where Assad was buried, between Assad's aid for 15 years and a local imam who oversees that cemetery. The imam is giving some criticisms on Assad's elevated marble tomb which he says is reflective of Christian influence and therefore un-Islamic. It should be flat on the ground, uh, the imam said, with some rocks on top of it uh, as markers of the burial site. This comment bothers and annoys <laughs> Assad's aid, which then leads to an unexpected verbal exchange. The, uh, the aide retorts that he'd seen larger tombs in Morocco and asked the imam sarcastically which, which century does he belong to and where does he get such nonsense. The aide reacts that it has nothing to do with Islam and it's not even found in the Quran. The exchange abruptly falls into an awkward silence followed by the imam exiting the cemetery without a saying a word. The aide, while cleaning the tomb, speaks to the cameraman saying, if Assad could rise from the grave, he'd say, you don't know what you're talking about. That's all wrong. Assad wasn't like that at all. And then the aide adds, poor guy, even in his grave, he's got to struggle with fundamentalists. Poor guy. <laughs> with that, the 92-minute uh, documentary ends. Born in 1900 a Jew of a Jewish family in former Austro-Hungarian Empire in the city now called Lviv, Ukraine, Leopold Weiss turned Muhammad Assad, who died in 1992, refused to be labeled as a modernist or reformist, that is, other than being called an ordinary Muslim. However, scholars who have studied his works describe him essentially, essentially and a modernist by virtue of the fact that he was seeking to find out in the meaning, to find out the meaning in the text at the present time on the basis of human experience by embracing the interpretative methods of the Western culture. He would then be the opposite to a traditionalist whose emphasis is what is true for all time. Assad's modernistic ideology is not only memorialized in his avid advocacy for the revivification of Islam, which instrumentally led, led him to play a very significant role in the establishment of the Republic of Pakistan in 1947. In fact, many would not hesitate to classify Assad as among the prestigious ranks of shapers of Islam's contemporary upsurge. But this modernistic ideology is above all palpably demonstrated in his translation and commentary of the Arabic Quran in his magnum opus called The Message of the Quran, which was published in 1980. Muhammad Assad confidently distinguished his work of translation from the rest of the extant English versions as capable of bringing Muslim and non-Muslims into, quote, intangible communion with the spirit of the language of the Arabic Quran, in quote. He ascribed the bulk of his credential as an interpreter of the Quran to his post-conversion pilgrimage to Mecca and his six year sojourn in Arabian Peninsula in the late 1920s. Incidentally, we pray for those who have uh, perished and uh, injured in yesterday's accident in Mecca. This deep cultural immersion allowed Assad, among other things, to acquire the idiomatic and linguistic qualifications which, according to him, is fundamentally authoritative and necessary for anyone venturing in uh, Quranic translations. It is a qualification which he believed that many of his precursors did not obtain, but simply from an academic study of the language. This latter method has resulted, as many critics would, would attest, to a quality of translations which betray more of the semantic universe of the Bible and of Western ideologies 
and are therefore essentially estranged from the inherent features of the Arabic language that Muslims ascribe as integral to the holistic appreciation of the divine writ. The modernistic character of the message of the Quran is patently indicative in Assad's rationalistic approach in his style of translation or interpretation and his copious commentaries. This approach is basically corollary to his appraisal of the Quranic message and its linguistic behavior as forming one unbreakable whole. This means that its meaning does not only lie in the literal meaning of the words employed, but in their very substance and in their sound. It has a language that is both condensed and elliptical, demanding of those who hear or read it a profound effort both of comprehension and of imagination. Thus, Assad argues that the message of the Quran is rational by the virtue of the fact that it appeals to tafakaruna, to people who think, to human understanding and perception, to unblocking, unlocking its meaning and relevance for human existence. This is demonstrated, for example, in his treatment of al-ghaib, which Assad roughly equates as a metaphys metaphysical elements of the Quran. He said that while these elements are beyond the reach of human perception, they are nonetheless accessible to reason as they are conveyed in empirical ways by employing mundane vehicles of ideas, ideas metaphors, or lone images derived from our actual physical or mental experiences. The same is true with the mutashabihat, which he roughly translates as allegories. Those passages of the Quran which are expressed in a figurative manner with a meaning that is metaphorically implied but not uh, directly stated. Falling under this category are not only sui generis uh, Quranic metaphysical narratives, but also the Quranic awareness of the miracle stories in the Bible. From Assad's rationalist standpoint, therefore, since these stories like God's parting the Red Sea or Jesus' miracles, not excluding Muhammad's night's journey, are not satisfactorily perceived by human imagination, they are rendered or understood as mere spiritual experiences. Another indication of Assad's modernistic approach to his translation of the Quran is his proclivity for progressive imagination. There are themes in which Assad treats in a rationalistic way so that they advance an all-embracing Quranic meaning. An example is his consistent rendition of the Arabic root sin lam mim, the popular triliteral root uh, of words like al-Islam, as-salam, or Muslim, into surrender or, or self-surrender. He believed this to be the pre-institutionalized concept and the right connotation intended by the divine revelation. As such, this Quranic category denotes inherent universality and therefore encompass any specific act of monotheistic submission or surrendering to the divine. This means that nowhere in Assad's uh, translation can words like al-Islam or Muslim be found since these categories, according to him, are later ideological conceptualization. In fact, echoing uh, the presentation of Professor Siri yesterday, Assad faulted many uh, of the errors of early English translation of the Quran on their uncritical dependence on the explanations of the classical commentators rather than be guided by the idiomatic and linguistic usage prevalent at the time of the revelation of the Quran. Assad's insistence on the application of the method of historical and textual criticism in, in his anglicized, anglicized version reveals his consistent impulse to pursue a different way of pre presenting the meaning of the text of the Quran that, that speaks to the modern mind by availing of the modern interpretative devices. The first time I consulted Assad's the message of the Quran, I was literally taken, comparatively speaking, by the distinctive modus operandi by which he renders the Arabic Quran. The novel way by which he explains or exposes the meaning of the Quran versus to me, a Christian, an Asian slash Western educated person, 
uh, makes me profoundly curious what this man and his work could offer to present the message of the Quran, or Islam for that matter, not only to the current scholarship of the Quran, but more importantly, to a contemporary world that continues to struggle to reconcile confusing voices of moderation and extremism. It is therefore from this state of curiosity that I continue to seek to understand and discover the historical circumstances and sources of influence that are formative to Muhammad Assad's ideology and inspiration to present the beauty of the Quran in a modern way. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Siyong Ho Francis Lee, and uh, my title is Bonaventure and Chinu, Christian and Buddhist Models for Integration of the Intellectual and Spiritual Life. And it's obvious why I chose Bonaventure and Chinu, considering my identity as a Franciscan from South Korea. <laughs> well, I will just briefly introduce why I chose these two figures besides my identity. Bonaventure and Chinu, and what I wanted to do through this project. Saint Bonaventure Banyo born in 1217 and died in 1274, is one of the great mystical theologians and leaders of the Order of Friars Minor, or the Franciscan Order. <coughs> Bonaventure himself led a life fully immersed in the philosophical and theological enterprises of the University of Paris until he was elected General Minister of the Order of Friars Minor in 1257. The election to that significant leadership position obliged the Master of Theology to take care of the souls of his friars and the Catholic faithful. While committing himself to the new task of caring for souls, he made good use of his intellectual capacity by writing books for the sake of the spiritual care of the friars and all Christians. Bonaventure, the shepherd of the Franciscan flock, was still Bonaventure, the theologian and philosopher. Well versed in all forms of intellectual culture of his age and deeply learned in the traditions of figures like Augustine, Suodionysius, Anselm, Bernard of Clairvaux, and Richard of St. Victor, he produced what Ewart Cousins has aptly called a speculative system with the spirituality at its core and a spiritual system enhanced by theoretical reflection. Just as Bonaventure's life and writings inspired the Christian theologians, so too Pojo Chinu, born in 1157, 1158 and died in 1210, was, was and is still an exemplary model for Zen students, monks, and laypersons especially in Korean Zen tradition. He too encouraged the application of a doctrinal scriptural learning to the practice of meditation. In 12th century Korea, the Buddhist establishment was divided into two conflicting <coughs> groups, Kyo, or doctrinal sect, and Zen, Zen meditation sect. To the former group belonged the scholar monks who concentrated on the highly theoretical doctrine of the uh, Huayan tradition while to the latter belong Zen monks who were primarily practitioners of meditation. Zen monks who criticized their Huayan contemporaries, arguing that emphasis on scriptural study and doctrinal debate only hinders practitioners from attaining a mediated insight into the true nature of reality. On the other hand, the Huayan monks accused the Zen practitioners of ignoring the word of Buddha and of <coughs> insufficient understanding of the teachings of Buddha. For our current purposes, it is especially worth noticing that the conflict between Zen practitioners and Kyo, the doctrinal scholars in Korea, is analogous to what was happening among Franciscans in 13th through 14th century Europe when friars who were zealous in the strict observance of the rule of the order and following their founder's model of evangelical life, were skeptical of learning and study, worried that the friars would comp compromise St. Francis' ideal of poverty. Chinu himself was first of all a confirmed Zen student. Nevertheless, he realized that the scriptural 
and scholastic teachings both confirmed and were confirmed by his own Zen experiences. That is, his Zen experiences and scriptural studies confirmed each other. This assured him of the merit of scriptural and doctrinal study in the service of the advancement of Zen practice by providing the necessary theoretical foundation. Thus, he came to incorporate non-Zen texts and doctrinal discourses into his writings, which, was, which were addressed primarily to Zen practitioners. In doing so, just as Bonaventure had relied on the long scholastic and spiritual traditions passed down to him, Jinu also critically observed the vast array of philosophical and soteriological debates and scriptures of the greater East Asian Buddhist tradition. Thus, Bonaventure and Jinu, rough contemporaries, their lives separated by only a decade, though living on the opposite sides of the world and following quite disparate religious traditions, nonetheless share some noteworthy common elements. Both men, as greatly influential and highly respected religious leaders, had to confront a similar problem, which they strove to resolve by reconciling and integrating elements previously seen as conflicting. It is even the case that the tone or mode of their writings changed in a similar way over the course of their lives. Both men, as their spiritual lives deepened, came increasingly to use apophasis as their primary mode of discourse. It is very, very intriguing to recognize similarities in their religious backgrounds, in the nature of the challenges they faced, and even the ways of response to them. Nevertheless, differences between their respective cultural, social, intellectual, and especially their religious milieu contributed to the different result in their efforts to integrate learning and spirituality and the, the changes in their soteriolog soteriological method. In both Bonaventure's theoretical and spiritual treatises, we can easily identify his synthesis of theories and spirituality where the tension between cataphasis and epiphasis is still obvious. Although the spiritual and theoretical journey ultimately ends in the epiphatic dimension. It is the Buddhist counterpart, in the Buddhist counterpart, the tension between the Buddha nature doctrine and the emptiness doctrine will be comparable with the cataphasis and epiphasis tension, which entails the demand to examine the doctrinal tension between Buddha nature, which is a positive claim on the ultimate reality and emptiness, which is an apophatic claim on the ultimate reality as unfolded in Jinu's writings. Therefore, through the comparative study of these two attempts, one by Saint Bonaventure and the other by state preceptor Jinu to synthesize learning and practice, I will examine the nature of these tensions between theory and the praxis and between cataphasis and epiphasis and will consider the interrelationship between the two tensions. I will also analyze how the distinctive doctrines of the two religions shape their respective views of the theory and praxis dynamic and also cataphasis and epiphasis dynamic. What Bonaventure and Jinu accomplished in the past has relevance even today. They have much to say to the today's intellectuals of Christianity and Buddhism, especially to theologians like us, who accumulate wealth of knowledge but can find ourselves sometimes alienated from the spiritual life. Both Bonaventure and Jinu may be able to help us attain the right attitude toward academic learning while also elucidating ways in which to integrate our knowledge with the faith and spirituality. Furthermore, this comparative project would clarify the ways in which the two traditions Christianity and Buddhism differ from each other in their soteriology, epistemology, ontology, and anthropology, while also, I hope, shedding new in insights for both Christianity and Buddhism in regard to the fundamental issue of uh, cataphasis, epiphasis tension arising in theoretical discourses and spiritual practices. Thank you.
So I first want to just thank you so much for inviting me from Boston College. Uh, my name is JC Joseph, and I am a fourth year doctoral student in systematic theology with a focus in ecclesiology. So ornamental or integral beauty, Catholicity from the interstitial perspective. The rite itself was extremely ancient, going back in outline at least to the fourth century, but with many late additions and ceremonies of a distinctly African flavor. The language was classical Ethiopian. As the books of the Gospels was being enthroned, the spirited chanting was accompanied by the deep rhythms of African drums, the ringing of bells, and the shaking of tambourines, causing the New York Journal American to headline its story, African Drums Boom in Vatican Rite. On November 28, 1962, the entire Episcopal Assembly at the Second Vatican Council participated in a Eucharistic celebration of the Ethiopic Catholic Church led by the Archbishop Addis Ab of Addis Ababa. Before the council, many Western bishops had little exposure to the Eastern Catholic churches and knew less about their distinctive uh, theological and liturgical heritage. The opportunity to participate in each other's liturgies, coupled with the occasion to meet indigenous bishops from around the world, often translated itself into a newfound appreciation for the particular churches and local cu cultures that constitute the Catholic communion. Several conciliar passages reflect this newfound appreciation. In Lumen Gentium, the council claims uh, that in virtue of this Catholicity, there are legitimately in the ecclesial communion particular churches which retain their own traditions without prejudice to the chair of Peter, which presides over the entire assembly of charity and protects their legitimate variety while at the same time taking care that these differences do not diminish unity, but rather contribute to it. In Orientalum Ecclesiarum, this point is reiterated by emphasizing that these individual churches, whether of the East or West, although they differ in liturgy, ecclesiastical discipline, and spiritual heritage, are nevertheless of equal dignity. These conciliar passages differ remarkably from prior pronouncements on the Eastern churches. In 1894, Pope Leo XIII wrote the encyclical Orientalium Dignitas, in which he extolled the Eastern, Church, Eastern Catholic liturgies as brilliant jewels whose breathtaking beauty illustrate the profound mark of Catholicity for the Church. The striking ceremonies and the expressions of ancient tongues are compared to the Bride of Christ, who is prefigured by the psalmist as a queen arrayed in embroidered gold and ornate jewelry. While certainly insisting on the dignity of the Eastern traditions in union with Rome, these opulent images and acclamations emphasize an ornamental rather than integral appreciation of these rites in relation to Rome. This emphasis upon ceremony also ignores the dynamic, concrete experiences of each particular church as equal expressions of the faith. Seventy years later, the conciliar document Orientalum Ecclesiarum, which I mentioned earlier, officially recognize these Eastern traditions as individual churches in their own right. Khaled Anatolius, whom you guys recently stole from us at Boston College, um, <laughs> argues that the significant development lies in a replacement of poetic imagery with doctrinal language. Although distinguished by their vener venerable antiquity, these churches come from the apostles and through the fathers. They are part of the divinely revealed, undivided heritage of the universal church. In this latter sense, he argues, the Roman church stands alongside the Eastern churches as co-recipients of an integral divine revelation. It's not so much about appreciating the Eastern rites or protecting them, but, it, an, but re realizing that they are an inalienable aspect of divine revelation. In this regard, we see how the conciliar documents emphasize the integral position rather than the ornamental beauty of the Eastern Catholic churches. Yet, many post-conciliar accounts of Catholicity seem to be reverting back to a more ornamental conception of ecclesial diversity. A. Riedelis demonstrates how in light of this emerging world church, Catholicism has continued to struggle for a clearer sense of its ecclesial identity. While aware that the Council wished to respect the sensitivities of Eastern Catholics who do not wish to be called Roman, he argued that in authentic Catholic theology, Roman doesn't mean Western, Latin, Mediterranean, Southern, or Italian. Rather, the designation Roman Catholic emphasizes that Rome is the center, the principle of unity, and Catholic is the periphery, the principle of diversity. 
Despite the conciliar appreciation of the local and the particular, this dominant spatial metaphor of the Roman center and the peripheral local churches does not properly maintain the creative underlying tension of Catholicity as a unity that does not confuse difference and a diversity that does not divide unity. It also does not enable a genuine reciprocity within the Catholic communion. Still rooted in an understanding of Catholicity as universality, this concept mirrors the spatial image of a compass drawing a circle around a central point. While this metaphor has the capacity to unite all that lies within its boundaries, it treats internal differences, particularly of the Eastern churches, as ornamental rather than integral to the faith. This attitude further alienates the church from relating to the differences that appear where the boundaries of the periphery encounter the field of dialogue and mission. A center periphery metaphor therefore understands difference from the standpoint of ecclesial <coughs> unity, but left uncorrected, it fails to account adequately for genuine ecclesial difference. What spatial metaphor then better accounts for this dynamic tension between unity and diversity that constitutes Catholicity? In my dissertation, I will first argue that a theological account of ecclesial Catholicity for the global church necessitates a shift in spatial metaphors that govern the Catholic ecclesiological imagination. Second, I will then examine the historical and ethnographic experiences of three Eastern Catholic churches in diaspora that demonstrate the efficacy of this shift. Finally, I will apply the epistemological insights gained from the historical and ethnographic data to current ecclesiological discussions of Catholicity. So first, if Catholicity pertains to the whole, then the principle of Catholicity does not emerge at the periphery of the Roman center, but between the peripheries of all the local churches in the Catholic communion. This third space that emerges at the interstices between churches not only, focus, uh, not only forces the enunciation of difference, but also the question of how we relate in the midst of this difference. The hermeneutical shift to the interstices necessitates a corresponding epistemological shift to an interstitial perspective that is attentive to the kinds of relationships that emerge from between. Second, conciliar conceptions of Catholicity based on an appreciation of local and particular cultures often assumed a modern definition of culture that would characterize them as harmonious wholes and integrated wholes. Consequently, the, the council did not anticipate the central fugal processes of globalization and the eruption of migrants that would characterize the next 50 years. A new Catholicity for a global church, according to Robert Schreider, must be attentive to these concrete ecclesial realities of ambiguity and fragmentation, experienced especially by the churches in diaspora. Because several Eastern Catholic churches in North America live in between multiple cultures and multiple ecclesial expressions of the Catholic faith, they capture this experience of globalization and the struggle for ecclesial identity within the Catholic communion. My research, therefore, um, will examine the particular historical and ethnographic experiences of Catholicity from the perspective of three Eastern Catholic churches in Boston, the Ethiopic Catholic from North Africa, the Malkite Greek Catholic from the Middle East, Lebanon, and Syria, and the Sarah Malabar Catholic Church from India. In order to gain a concrete sense of how a more postmodern definition of culture impacts ecclesial self-understanding. Analyzing these churches from the interstitial perspective will require consideration of their narrative of origins while paying close attention to the colonial encounters that impact their ecclesial identity today. I will also examine how each community understands its own cultural and ecclesial identity at the interstices of their homeland the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston, and other Eastern Catholic churches in the greater Boston area. My research, therefore, will have to consider carefully what emerges between the peripheries of these local churches. Um, lastly, I propose that the postcolonial insights of liminality, orientalism, and hybridity um, can shed considerable light on the experiences of these Eastern Catholic churches, while also advancing a more adequate theological account of ecclesial Catholicity for the global church. Um, I won't go into all of them because I don't have time. Oh, okay. Well, I still don't think uh, that's okay. Um, but <laughs> so um, from the postcolonial theory, uh, the interstitial perspective therefore insists that the third space carries the burden and meaning of culture because it forces the enunciation of difference in relation to the other. Similarly, in light of insights from Asian American theologians and uh, Hispanic theologians, one can argue that the burden and meaning of Catholicity also emerges from the interstices. While these third spaces have historically been a place of colonial violence and globalized ambiguity, the peripheries between local churches also bear the potential for a fuller manifestation of the church's Catholicity. Wherever two Catholic churches encounter one another, there resides the potential 
to recognize and experience within each other's differences the transformative power of the gospel. The encounter between local Catholic churches of the East and West particularly demonstrate this creative potential because the Eastern churches are neither products of European colonization nor ornamental to the tradition. Rather, as mentioned earlier, the Roman church stands alongside the Eastern churches as co-recipients of an integral divine revelation. Thank you. Thank you very much to these, our colleagues and students. Um, remarkable set of work ongoing in their writings and their thinking. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, let's just recognize very quickly that they did a remarkable job of elevator speeches that many, I, I would like to learn from. <laughs> um, secondly, on their behalf, my digest request that all of us, having heard this, feel quite free to consult with them with things you might know from your own writing and research that could assist them as they complete and advance in their dissertations. I know they would appreciate that. But now we do have some enjoyable time to confer with them with questions um, amidst our pride at Boston College and Notre Dame. Frank Clooney, then Brad Malkowski. Frank's question had to do with whether uh, Francis being a, born in Korea changes, as an autobiographical feature of his theology, changes the way he does his comparative project. Thanks. I think it definitely my identity as a Korean, I think distinguishes my position from other maybe American or European uh, theologians. Because, for example, when I uh, read Bonaventure and uh, the Chinul at the same time, I was I'm a little more inclined to word understanding Bonaventure, focusing on apophatic. apophatic. Uh, I tried to find apophatic elements because growing up, even I, I wasn't a Jan Buddhist, but I grew up that kind of uh, environment. So we appreciate most of the Catholics in Korea, nuns and brothers, religious, we appreciate Jan meditation and we think that kind of a contemplative life will be ultimate method for us. So I. When I found the apophatic aspect in Bonaventure, I was a little bit excited because as a Franciscan, I have something to grasp above and then maybe I can appreciate more. So it might be different from maybe for you, American or European Franciscan scholar read Bonaventure may approach a different way. Brad. First of all, <clears throat> a number of these dissertations sound like they're going to be multi-volume in their scope. Um, I, I have a question for Matt. <clears throat> I went to India in 2007, uh, one of my many visits, and one of the things I noticed is that how many Muslims were talking about Zakir Naik? And one of the things they said was, this man knows everything about other religions. And what I've observed in, a, in looking at his YouTube videos, that he misrepresents other religions, what they're all about. Has there been much public discussion about the way he presents incorrectly other religions? Yeah, I noted that, uh, you know, presenting himself as a scholar of comparative religion is a major plank. And, and I didn't mention, but, but Nayak is an is a, is a example of a new kind of Muslim authority. He's not classically trained. He doesn't have classical training in the tradition. And so he's a, what scholars call a new religious intellectual. And one of the planks upon which I think he has, has gained a hearing is this discourse of comparative religion. And yes, you rightly note that it's not comparative religion in the sense that we do it, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's looking at other religions so as to uh, elevate his own version of Islam. Um, yeah, there, there certainly has been blowback, uh, from, especially from more Sufi-minded Muslims in India. The Baradlis, for example, the Baradli movement tends to dislike him. They, they label him Wahhabi. And he, has, he does have a close relationship with Saudi, uh, Saudi theology and more Salafi kinds of Islam. 
Um, he is, the Deobandis are cautious about him. They don't, they don't know whether they like him or not. Um, and of course, Shiites uh, don't like him either. So uh, it's important to bring out that, though in a short presentation I emphasize the popularity of this, of this individual, he has actually, he's very illustrative, and I'm gonna bring this out of my dissertation, of, of intra-Islamic contestation, intra-Islamic debate uh, over a figure like this. So, hope that answers the Thanks, question. Matt. Peter Casarella. Uh, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, for Jay-Z, um, besides synodality, there's another Francis effect uh, image I wanted to raise in terms of your project, and that's the distinction in Evangelii Gaudium between the polyhedron and the sphere. Um, Juan Carlos Canoni, the uh, Argentine Jesuit, has written a lot about Argentine background to Pope Francis, says that this is a key to understanding his whole way of thinking. And it comes from the Argentine interpretation of Gardini's opposites, dialogue through opposites. But it, it just seemed to me that this, because uh, he uses it in terms of Pentecostals, I don't know if he uses it in terms of uh, Eastern churches, but it's a key thing for Pope Francis that polyhedrons being multi-centered forms of unity are superior to spheres, and it, it struck me very similar to the interstices. Okay. You can speak. Oh, no. Thank you, I'll definitely look into that. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel Reynolds um, from Notre Dame. So this is a, it's just a general question, but I think maybe applies both to Allison and Enno. Um, and it's just, uh, I suppose, my curiosity about the interreligious context of both of the questions you're studying. So Asit himself has an interreligious journey, starting out as a Jew and converting to Islam. Um, and so, what element of that um, is evident in his, either in his translation or his other thought? So um, that interreligious context, but then also in the African context, Uganda, of course, as far as I know, is a place of great um, religious diversity, also significant Muslim presence and obviously various Protestant traditions. So how has that been reflected in these charismatic movements? Thank you for that question, yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's uh, the, the interreligious character of Assad's translation of the Quran, specifically in, the, his, in his translation of the Quran. Um, even, if, even if he's trying to contest the, uh, the, the doctrines of the Jews or the Christians of the Quran, he tried to put it in a very, uh, in, a, in, a, in a platform of dialogue. So which means that there is given there the doctrines of, of, Asa, of the Jews and the Quran, and here is the Quran will try to contest that. So uh, this Assad is trying to use the word interreligious not in a sense of the, the ironic kind of way, but in a, in a, in a kind of word uh, confrontation. And also I think the other one that I gave the example of his translation of, there are many other examples in his translation or rendition, like the, uh, the Sin Lam Mim, you know, it's a very, he, he's, he, what he's, the implication here in his translation is that he is trying to say that the Quran is universal. It's not, it's not Islam in its, in its essence. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, institutional. So it's speaking to all the Quran and uh, the, the Jews and the Christians, even right at this point in time. So there's an interreligious there, not from the standpoint of um, Islamic institution. And okay. Yeah, and Gabriel, to address your question, in this particular parish, there, Islam is a very tiny presence. So the more, I think the more relevant interreligious context is um, the relationship between these charismatic movements and, um, and African indigenous religions there. Um, so there is definitely a concern among those in leadership in the parish that the charismatic movements are maybe living out of a spirituality that owes a bit more to the indigenous religious traditions than to Christianity. Teresia Hinga. Yes, uh, my comments are for Jay-Z and uh, Alison. And first of all, uh, Jay-Z to appreciate uh, the perspective you are bringing uh, to the whole question of, um, yes, and to appreciate the fact that you are considering the immigrants and their spirituality as bringing something to the table of conversation. I like the whole idea of the immigrants double vision and probably multiple uh, vision and wondering uh, 
uh, where, where where you can how you can um, probably integrate the uh, the studies on hybridity, particularly uh, in terms of the African um, de development of African spiritualities mm -hmm. in in the diaspora, uh, the, the the Black Atlantic uh, studies, for example. Uh, that might be an, uh, a place to look for comparative uh, studies, but I really appreciate uh, that you are looking for integration rather than just ornamental, uh, ornamental uh, uh, seeing these uh, foreign cultures as, you know, just ornamental rather than integral to the development of Catholicity and so forth. Um, and for Alison, I also appreciate uh, your studies in Uganda and the fact that you are, when they say charis Catholic charismatic, it's like a generic monolith, monolith there, but it's very complex. Um, and my question for you is, how does the hierarchy and its interpretation of this phenomena uh, f feature in either in uh, facilitating those conflicts or facilitating the solution of those conflicts? Because in Kenya, for example, uh, the hierarchy has been kind of uh, uh, in opposition We're to... Wary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just so I understand, the question was sort of how I was going to integrate hybridity more yes. into my, so. Um, so one of the ideas behind uh, bringing especially that quotation, Homi Baba was saying that the truest vision may now lay with uh, the migrant's double vision is because I think that he's hitting upon something that you see popping up in Asian American uh, theology and Latino, Latina uh, theologians and, and uh, the black conscious, the African, um, you mentioned Black Atlantic, correct? Yes, and so what it is is this, uh, this, this third space often is embodied by most migrants, right? And they have this sense of living in between. So Peter Fan says there's often this dehumanizing sense of being neither nor, but also this uh, creative potential to be both and. And so how to move into that positive creative space where uh, people no longer feel that they are on the mar margins, but they're able to really contribute to a sense of what the church is becoming. Um, and so I think that th you see this in different theologies and how to then bring it all together into a, an interstitial perspective where um, we're not talking in parallel, but now we're actually talking together and, and hitting upon the same reality and what that means for the church. So that's sort of what I'm imagining. To just briefly answer your question, um, I think that the, the bishops in Uganda have been fairly supportive of the charismatic renewal. They see this as a positive development. They recognize that it can go to excess and can have its dangers. But in general, people recognize it as something that is increasing people's participation in the sacramental life of the church and creating engaged Catholics and preventing them from exiting the Catholic church to join other Pentecostal and charismatic movements. Um, for the Bekaizo, the diocese has actually been engaged a little bit in promoting the Bekaizo, but they also tend to be more wary of the Bekaizo, especially because they perceive that movement to be less regulated than the charismatic renewal, so they see it as something of a loose cannon that's in need of correction and oversight. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? All right. I think coffee summons us. Um, once again, please join me in thanking our colleagues who presented these papers.